to say a few words about why we are here because I'm acutely conscious of the fact like everybody is that the media don't always report the facts politicians oops I'm dead <laughs> what do I do thank you um, politicians don't always tell the truth so why are we here well 
I suppose one reason why we're here is because we feel betrayed. We feel betrayed about promises and mechanisms that were set up back in 2006 in order to deal with pensions. We feel frustrated because we are being blamed for something that is not our problem. Teachers, university lecturers, PCS workers, we're not the cause of this crisis. And yet, we get blamed for this all the time, as does the public sector generally. We're also disillusioned. We're disillusioned with a government that makes us, or is trying to make us pay for that crisis. And even Mervyn King, the Governor of the Bank of England, recognises that it's unfair to blame public sector workers for a crisis which was not their making. And Mervyn King is not what you'd call a militant trade unionist. <laughs> and finally, we're here today because we're angry. We're angry because public sector workers are very mindful <laughs> of looking to the future. Could you not get to do we spend our lives caring and providing services for the public. And part of what we do is also think about ourselves in the future. And we save. We save through pension schemes. And now we're being put into a situation where our saving plans are being threatened by a government that appears to want to blame us for something that was not our problem. Now, as I said earlier, I'll, I'll be speaking between speakers from time to time. But what I'd like to do now is introduce Ian Lever, who's secretary for Leicestershire National Union of Teachers and also national executive member for uh, the Midlands region. Thank you. I think I need to do a kind of Joey Ramone style stance here, I think. Um, I've been, uh, I've been thinking about what I was going to say at this rally, actually for quite a long time, well before the rally was planned. Uh, actually way back, uh, kind of in April really, when it became absolutely clear that uh, the government was going to break its promise not to affect teachers and other public sector workers' accrued rights, which they did back in April. They did that when they changed the indexing of people's pensions from RPI to CPI. So the idea that talks are still ongoing, which of course they are, but yet they haven't introduced any changes yet, is simply not true. Because they have started that already, and that is already affecting existing pensioners, not people who have not yet taken their pension. To be honest, I shouldn't really be short of things to say. Every time Michael Gove opens his mouth, he comes out with something even more ludicrous than the last time. Or he ends up giggling on uh, Radio 4. I don't know whether you heard that the other week, but it was just embarrassing to listen to. I actually had a head teacher uh, ask me just the other week whether, whether the NUT was paying Michael Gove to say this stuff. You would wonder, really. You only have to look at this turnout, even though it's looking a bit blustery and what have you, but to look at the turnout here, hundreds of people here now, to know that teachers are furious. They're angry at the proposals that are being made and they're clearly angry at the fact that there is no intention by the government to discuss this in any kind of and serious and sensible way. I was also mindful when I was thinking of what to say today of the last time the NUT was involved in strike action like this when we had that uh, rally at the Athena when we had a one day strike over pay. And we were lucky then to have the, uh, the wonderful Mark Steele uh, talking to us then. I didn't dare uh, invite Mark Steele again. I thought I might be pushing my luck to try and persuade him and come and, and, and talk to us again. But uh, instead I thought actually I might just cheat in terms of doing this speech and read out his article from last week's Independent, his column in last week's Independent. Uh, I'm sure there are people here who've, uh, who've read it actually, but I think it's worth listening to again. Uh, I don't think I'll, uh, I won't make any attempt to, uh, to match Mark's uh, comic, comic timing. I shall just read the article out. Uh, it's entitled, uh, No Wonder Firemen Are On The Rich Lists. Let me just uh, sort this out first. Huh?
How's the government getting away with this idea that public sector pension is a luxury? Is it something that suave bachelors could show off saying, once I've taken for you for a spin in my Aston Martin, how about to show you the mid-range forecast for my teacher's pension over a bottle of Verve Clico? A pension is a necessity. So you might as well say, we simply can't go on enjoying the luxury of a sewage system, given that the amount of waste we're flushing is 35% higher than it was in 1996. So from 2015, you've got to throw it all out the window, otherwise we'll end up like Greece. Also, a pension is part of a wage. It's not an added on bonus. Employers don't come round to schools and fire stations once a month, slipping a bundle of notes into each member of staff's pocket, whispering, here you are, darling, get yourself something nice. <laughs> the next complaint will be public sector workers who enjoy the privilege of spending all day in job centres and prisons paid for by the taxpayer are also paid money to spend on things. It was revealed in a shock inside report today. But apparently these pensions are gold-plated and it's where all our money has gone. So when you read that the richest thousand people in the country increased their wealth last year by 60 billion, number 34 on that list must be Alf, a retired fireman from Ipswich who now lives in Cannes on a boat he outbid Roman Abramovich for and holds parties where he uses his skills to spray cocktails into everybody's glass from a hose. <laughs> Number 49 will be Beryl, a retired midwife who's planning to buy Tottenham Hotspur when she can mount a challenge to the current chief shareholder, Amy, the retired lollipop lady from Workington. One of the most infuriating arguments to justify cutting pensions is that private sector workers don't have them, so why should anyone else? It's a strange way of assessing society that if someone is badly treated, that everyone else might as well, everyone else might, might as well be, otherwise it's not fair. Maybe the answer to the scandal in these care homes would be for uh, people of all ages to be left for two hours face down in a bowl of cold soup and then it'd be nice and equal. <laughs> Instead, the public sector unions asked their members if they wanted to take action against these cuts and overwhelmingly they said they do. It's argued by various politicians that the strikes are a stupid tactic as they make unions unpopular. Presumably unions should adapt to the model climate by no, bother, no longer bothering with issues such as their members being asked to work three extra years for no money and instead bring in colouring books and grow watercress. <laughs> Strangely, the unions have rejected the advice of people who can't stand them anyway and have gone along with the vote of their members because we do seem to be in a battle between opposite ways of seeing society. For example, there's the view of the caller on a phone-in this week who supported the rise in tuition fees because he said, I haven't got kids, so why should I pay for other kids' education? One answer to this is to point out that education benefits all of society, not just students, and to suggest a mild redistribution of wealth would make such facilities affordable and at the same time is looking after people once they've retired. But a better response, I think, is, is to say, oh really? I bet you see kids in a playground squealing with delight and think, bah, I'm not paying for those swings and that climbing frame. It's not fair, you miserable, cynical, uh, poxy, selfish pile of sludge. <laughs> well, seeing as you've got no kids, I don't suppose the soul will turn up to your funeral. But that better not mean you get a pauper's one because the taxpayer will be have to fork out for that. But I wonder why that's probably why I won't be a very successful politician. So that's Mark Steele here in, uh, in his article, if not in presence. Uh, to be honest, I wish... Uh, I, uh, I wish Mark Steele was a politician. He might show a little bit more backbone than a lot of the politicians in support of what we're doing here and up and down the country today. So thank you for turning up. Stay for the band, stay for the rest of the speeches and enjoy the afternoon. Thank you. Well, actually, let's just clarify. I'm from PCS. Um, and I'm also convener of an organisation called Leicestershire Against the Cuts, which was an initiative that PCS took last summer in advance of understanding that this sort of event would become the norm. That we would start to see ordinary working people saying, we didn't create the crisis that has led to the situation where we're told that there is a deficit in Britain that must be paid off immediately. As Andy says, this is probably my 30th day of strike action 
in about five years. And that affects my pension as well, because I lose a pension for every day, that, uh, a day off my pension. But I still think it's important that we're here today. We're here showing this government that we're not going to pay for the crisis not of our making. This week, I was on Radio Leicester, and Ben Jackson, the morning presenter, when I said to him, when I came into the civil service 40 years ago, I knew that I wouldn't get the sort of pay I might get in the, in the private sector. I wasn't going to get share options. I wasn't going to get a company car. I wasn't going to get a banker style bonus. But I was told, continually told, I had job security and I had a decent pension to look forward to when I retired. And that's my remuneration package. And Ben Jackson said to me, but the world's changed over 40 years, hasn't it? And I said to him, not if you're rich. The world hasn't changed at all if you're rich. If you're rich, you're still actually coining it in on the backs of people who are being made to pay for a crises that they didn't actually create. And is that greedy? Because I'm getting fed up of being told that actually stopping somebody putting their hand in my pocket and stealing money out of my pocket is being greedy. Well, if that's the case, every time somebody's house is burgled, you can say that they're being greedy in reporting it to the police. Because the burglar ought to be able to take away your prized possessions. And this is a government who I consider to be burglars. They are stealing from us. They are stealing from us. And let's not be, be two points about that. They are stealing. But of course, pensions are a cut. The reason they want to cut pensions is because they want it to be able to pay bankers their big bonuses. They want to be able to keep the banks afloat. Well, I have a message for Lord Hutton. Lord Hutton, Sir Fred Goodwin, Chairman, ex-chairman of the Royal Bank of Scotland, one of the people who paid casino banking with other people's money, lost other people's money, and then said, well, sorry about that, I'll have to go, won't I? Yes, but here you are, here's a pension of £345,000 a year for actually bringing the country to its knees. Now, Lord Hutton, are you going to deal with people like Fred Goodwin? We're all in this together, we're told. Well, let me say this, I don't see my interests being the same as 30 members of the cabinet are all millionaires. I don't see my interests as being the same of people who were educated on the fields of Eton and in the elite colleges of Oxford and Cambridge. I'm an ordinary bloke. I was brought up in Leicester. I went into the civil service because I actually believe that there is a public sector ethic. I actually believe in looking after my fellow man and woman and child. I believe in that ethic. And every one of us here today believes in that ethic or else we wouldn't be working in the public sector. That's why we're here. We believe in a public sector ethic. But let's say we want to be treated fairly. We want to be treated properly. We are ordinary people who want to be able to say we're being treated properly. So I don't believe I'm being greedy. I don't believe I'm being unreasonable. But I have to say, it pains me when the leader of the Labour Party actually says, you're wrong to go on strike. Well, Ed, what's your answer to that? Tell us to get round the negotiating table. Well, we are around the negotiating table, but we're negotiating with people like Danny Alexander, who tells us, please come and negotiate. But oh, by the way, it doesn't matter because we're going to implement Hutton anyway. Well, that's not negotiation. That's a sham. That's a sham and that's a farce. 
and we have to say we're not going to put up with that farce. And I have to say this to Ed Miliband, there'll be people on this park today who are Labour Party members. There'll be people who supported Labour. There'll be people who've actually put you into power. Do you think they did that so that you can tell them that they ought to just knuckle down and accept what the Tories and the Liberal Democrats are telling them? Of course not. And that raises a question in my mind. Whose interests do you represent, Mr Miliband? Whose interests are you there for? I know who I represent. I represent members today or up and down the country together with comrades from the NUT, from the ATL, from the UCU who have said this is enough. Before I came here we had a short rally at New Walk, bottom of New Walk, and many many unions were saying this is only the start and we expect to be with you in the autumn. We expect to be standing shoulder to shoulder. Three quarters of a million people, up to three quarters of a million people have been on strike today. When Unison, when Unite, when other unions come on board, that will swell to four to five million. If you don't understand, Mr Miliband, that you need to put your support behind the people who put you in power, and not the class enemy, not behind the Camerons of this world, not behind the Cleggs of this world, but the people who put you into power, then you can't expect those people to put you into power in the future. By ye friends you shall be known. It's an old phrase. So let me